I want to begin um, with um, a thank you and something of a confession. Um, the thank you is to David for inviting me to do this. And uh, David uh, has for many years, as I expect for many of us in this room, been a great stimulus to my thinking. Um, the confession is that I'd not really given much thought to this subject at all before David asked me to talk about it. Um, what I uncovered um, and discovered about Kenya, even though I'd been there for nearly four years, um, uh, both alarmed and excited me. And I want to share some of that sense of excitement and opportunity with you this morning. Let us consider for a moment what a profound challenge to Western secularism this motto from a school bus in Nairobi represents. Educating for life and eternity. Its reference to eternity means that this particular school, Logos Christian School, um, sees education as mission because it clearly presupposes the primacy of the biblical understanding of the purpose of life as the basis for education and public truth. And we might also notice that as transgender advocacy gains traction in North America and the UK, the representation of a boy and a girl in the logo could well be challenged as offensive gender stereotyping uh, in our own context. And I've shown this because I think it illustrates uh, just one small example of the thesis associated with Philip Jenkins, who argued in his influential book, The Next Christendom, that Africa is likely to be the Christian continent of the 21st century, as uh, what we might call the cultural imperialism of the secular West hits the buffers, and we come to terms with a fundamental shift in Christianity from the global north to the global south. This contrast between north and south is quite literally impressed upon Gillian and myself every Sunday in Nairobi as we worship at All Saints Cathedral, crammed together with some of the other 6,000 people who worship there every week. Yet when we start to look at what is actually happening in education in Kenya, some question marks start to appear about the sustainability of this new Christendom, if that is indeed what it is. In his study of Thomas Aquinas, G.K. Chesterton comments that Aquinas was not bringing something new into Christianity, but bringing Christianity into Christendom. I find this an illuminating contrast. The problem we have in the West is that many have bought into the lie, adapt or die, and thereby brought in something new, i.e. heresy. But the challenge for the emerging new Christendom of Africa is to bring Christianity into Christendom, as G.K. Chesterton put it. And I think this is especially urgent in education. I hope, therefore, in this brief survey focused on primary education in Kenya, which covers the first eight years, to illuminate the need for Christians to think much more clearly about education as mission. And although I'm focusing on Kenya, I suspect the basic dynamics are similar throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Schools were set up as an integral part of Christian missionary endeavour which got underway in earnest in the opening years of the 20th century. Where churches appeared, so did schools, and educational opportunity was a primary factor in leading many Africans to adopt Christian faith. Since the Education Act of 1968, which allowed church schools to remain under church management, but to be publicly funded, many Christian schools have been handed over to the state although the churches retained ownership of the land and buildings. Now, some 60% of Kenyan public, i.e. government-funded schools, are church-sponsored, and the mainstream Christian churches have continued to set up schools and then hand them over to the state for public funding. 
As about 85% of Kenyan children attend public schools, this means that around half of all pupils, all primary pupils, attend a public church school. However, in 2013, the Basic Education Act was passed, and this has diluted the influence of the church over its schools in five main ways. Firstly, it makes it the sponsoring church's responsibility to hire and pay any school chaplain. Since this is now law, any school that uses general funds to hire a chaplain is vulnerable to legal action. Secondly, the Act also reduced the number of board members that the sponsoring church may appoint, from four of the 13 board members to three. Thirdly, the Act revoked the right of the sponsor to have a hand in the appointment of the school head. When the sponsor could help choose, the school head always knew that there was someone watching. If the head was not adequately serving the school, the sponsor could go to the Ministry of Education and have the head removed. As a result, accountability has been diminished and schools have become more vulnerable to corruption. Fourth, the government is now claiming that the church schools are public institutions under the Act and is issuing title deeds to the county education boards. This has been condemned by the National Council of Churches of Kenya as land grabbing. Five, Muslims are also now able to sponsor public schools. This would seem to be simply a matter of equity in a secular state, but has in fact entrenched Islam in a way that Christianity is not. The new Kenyan constitution of 2010 exempted Muslims and their Qadi courts from the provisions on human rights and fundamental freedom in respect of matters relating to personal status, marriage, divorce and inheritance. In addition, some Islamic public schools are being monitored by the police because of suspected links with al-Shabaab, an Islamic terrorist group based in neighbouring Somalia, which has been responsible for a number of high-profile atrocities in recent years. So those are some problems with the legal framework. In addition, Christian education in the public sector suffers from a toxic combination of corruption and underfunding, which affects public education generally. Access to Kenya's public schools was made free in 2003, but in recent years, charges have crept back in the form of levies for admission, books, uniforms and exams, and too often these go into the pockets of the school administrators. Underfunding also means that there is a chronic shortage of teachers, so parents are forced to join together and pay out of their own pockets to hire extra teachers. The funds the government does pay are not always paid on time, and the whole sector is affected by recurrent strikes and mismanagement. It is true that school attendance has been very considerably expanded in recent years, and there is now almost universal primary education, with nearly 90% of Kenyan children in education, but standards have suffered. According to a World Bank report in 2013, Kenyan teachers were absent almost half the time, and pupils in public schools received on average little more than two hours instruction a day. Another study found that one third of public sector teachers, uh, only one third scored at least 80% when tested on the curriculum they were meant to be teaching. This brief survey shows that despite a predominantly Christian culture, in which 80% of Kenyans identify as Christian, and despite strong opposition to the secularising changes in education made by the National Council of Christian Churches of Kenya, the secular and to some extent Islamic agendas are increasingly shaping the nation's institutions. So perhaps the experience of those of us who are resisting the more advanced secularisation we see here in the UK means that we have something of importance to share with our Kenyan brothers and sisters, just as they have a spiritual vigour, clarity and confidence in the gospel, 
which is a constant inspiration to us. To focus in on what such a partnership might look like, I want to concentrate on the Kenyan side of the equation and make a few suggestions that follow from the facts that we have briefly surveyed. Here, I think James Davison Hunter's book, To Change the World, subtitled The Irony, Tragedy and Possibility of Christianity in the Late Modern World, is helpful. Although he's writing about the United States context, his argument is that it is possible to have an organized and substantial Christian presence articulating a biblical worldview, yet failing to be effective in changing society. And I think that helps us to understand a similar product, uh, paradox in Kenya. He argues that uh, Christians are ineffective despite having large numbers and vocal pressure groups because there is an institutional disconnect with the social, educational and political elites which form the centres of power and influence. The obvious conclusion to draw would be that Christians should therefore seek to be more effective in penetrating these elites. But Hunter instead proposes what he calls faithful presence, living quiet, uncontroversial lives and entrusting society to God rather than engaging in the rough and tumble of politics. This seems to me to be an inadequate and even rather perverse conclusion to draw, and I much prefer the obvious conclusion, especially in Kenya, where there is no history of evangelicals being identified with one political party, as in the United States. After all, if the social and political elites are not working within a Christian frame of reference, it really does not make much sense to talk of or hope for a new Christendom. That is not to say that established, establishing elites that are responsive to Christian values is an easy matter, even in the very different context of Kenya from the United States. The people at the highest levels in Kenyan society are the most globalised and therefore the most vulnerable to what Pope Francis has called ideological colonisation, especially when ideology is backed up by plentiful aid and loans. It is also sadly the case that the political class in Kenya are widely viewed as the most corrupt and since the elections of 2013 and the end of coalition government there has been a general deterioration in civic life with rising corruption, reduced transparency and attempts to gag the media and undermine the independence of the police. So if education as mission is essential to the basic task of bringing Christianity into Christendom and having a lasting impact, therefore, on the dominant elites. How can the church in Kenya become an effective agent of this change? And here I want to concentrate on the Anglican church. The key must be to recover the vision of the early missionary years in which education was seen as an integral part of mission. In the 21st century, that must mean high quality education at all levels, including the crucial formative primary years, education which develops a Christian mind and provo promotes biblically based character formation. As we have seen, Kenya is close to achieving universal primary education, but there is an acute problem of educational quality. And this is interesting in the light of Hunter's argument that the reason that the monasteries were so effective as centres for establishing medieval Christendom as it emerged from the early Middle Ages was that they were recognised and respected as centres of learning and it was that respect and learning which won them influence. The initiative must lie with the church. Unlike the Church of England, the Anglican Church of Kenya has not been largely hollowed out by an ambient secularism. It is still a church shaped by its recent missionary origins in the East African revival with the potential to be an agent of godly change in society. So how to move forward? 
Um, an article published last year in The Economist caught my eye about research which showed that two-thirds of private schools in Kenya were in practice cheaper than the supposedly free public schools, which, as we have already seen, are actually anything but. And though these private schools are cheaper, they offer much higher standards. And there are people who are now pioneering chains of low-cost private primary schools. This idea should be of very great interest to the church and to Christians for three immediate reasons. First of all, it, include, it increases inclusion by making good quality education affordable to far more. Secondly, the further removed an organisation is from government, the less likely it is to be corrupt and mismanaged. Kenya is currently ranked by Transparency International as 139th out of 168, 168 being the worst, in its Global Corruption Perceptions Index. And thirdly, noting the work of Christopher Dawson, which David referred to yesterday, by moving into the private sector, education is set free from the secularising machinery of control, which tends to set in when education is seen as the re overwhelming responsibility of the state. In Kenya, the tragedy of many public schools is that children are not only failed educationally, but become habituated to a dysfunctional environment at the most formative stage of their lives. A growing chain of low-cost and sustainable Anglican-controlled private schools throughout Kenya, beginning at primary level, would therefore seem to be a sustainable and very effective form of a mission which could put the vision of a new Christendom on a secure footing and rescue children from a cycle of underachievement, underachievement and low expectations. In this context, let me conclude with some brief comments on what might therefore constitute fruitful partnership in education as mission, supporting the Anglican Church of Kenya in a still young nation with many opportunities before it and sharing some hard-won lessons from the context of an old nation in which we are facing the challenges of moral, spiritual and political decline. Firstly, collaboration in the setting up of a chain, to which I've already referred, of low-cost and sustainable Anglican private schools, beginning at the primary level. Secondly, mission partner educators to work with Kenyan nationals, especially in teacher training. I'm interested that the Presbyterian Church of East Africa already trains teachers alongside pastors and produces people that can go into either form of ministry, seeing both as equally crucial for mission. And as far as I'm aware, the Anglican Church of Kenya has yet to recognise the importance of that. Thirdly, mission partner chaplains, especially in the top, um, in the key top schools where the Anglican Church of Kenya has not been able or willing to find its own clergy to uh, fill those posts. And fourthly, um, support to re-energise the stalled Kenya Anglican University project with a vision to be an internationally competitive university with a coherent and intentional Christian ethos. And if these various aspects of partnership can be undergirded by the GAFCON Jerusalem Statement and Declaration, it will have a theological strength through a secure and internationally recognised confessional basis and would gain the social strength, and would gain social strength if leadership comes not only from the province, um, but also from All Saints Cathedral in Nairobi, which is de facto Kenya's national cathedral, with a weekly congregation of around 6,000 people and strong financial resources, with a particular ministry 
to many of Nairobi's top professionals and business people. So to conclude, my sense is that the future of Kenya and of Africa as the new Christendom is not assured, in fact may be hanging in the balance. It is not necessarily a Christian future. We could see the rise of a new generation, too many of whom have been brought up on a toxic mixture of chaotic public education and the insidious erosion of Christian social capital that comes through ready access to a globalised media, entrenching family breakdown, social disorder and poverty, which in turn make the nation vulnerable to well-funded and disciplined Muslim groups. On the other hand, and this is my prayer, if the churches grasp the vision of education as a mission, we will see the transformation over time of the whole fabric of society as the Bible shapes the education of more and more children for, um, to borrow a phrase, life and eternity. Thank you.